This is the Gulf Stream, thousands of miles in length, flowing through the Atlantic Ocean and carrying a gigantic volume of water, 50 times greater than all the rivers on Earth. On the surface, peaceful in appearance, yet containing tremendous dynamic forces of heat and energy which directly affect much of the climate and life on Earth. This day on the stream seems like any other, but something has changed, something is different. For far below in its depths, six men are silently drifting with the current in a submersible. Their objective, to drift along for 30 days for 1,500 miles at depths of 500 to 1,800 feet, studying the little understood forces of the Gulf Stream, always moving with it, sometimes faster, sometimes slower caught up by its contradictory currents through its unpredictable waters to, in fact, become an actual part of this vast and little-known underwater world. It all began as the idea of a famous Swiss scientist, Dr. Jacques Picard, who designed a unique submersible and dreamed of venturing beneath the Gulf Stream to open a window to knowledge never before attainable. The Grumman Aerospace Corporation accepted the challenge of building the submersible and sponsoring the Gulf Stream drift. The United States Navy joined in the project, providing instruments scientists and surface ships, and the dream began to take form. On August 21, 1968, Louisa Castle, a direct descendant of Benjamin Franklin, the first man to chart the Gulf Stream, christened the submersible. Then began the exacting task of fitting out the craft with its payload of instruments supplied by the Navy. Marvels of modern electronics. Instruments to take continuous measurements of gravity and periodic measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. A transmissometer and an ambient light meter to measure light absorbed by the water and the level of natural light. Meters to measure current speeds and direction. Sensors to detect temperature, salinity, sound velocity, and depth of the Gulf Stream waters. Anemometers to measure the water's turbulence. Continuous transmission FM sonar warns of obstacles in the sea and observes and monitors the elusive deep scattering layer. There are sound velocity probes, too, to study acoustics. Sonar beacons and transponders permit the submersible to be tracked from the surface. Cameras and television are electrically actuated and synchronized to strobe lights. At last, all is in readiness, and the day of the mission approaches. The crew has been carefully selected and trained. Dr. Jacques Picard, senior scientist aboard. The thing is not so, uh, so much like a precise river. It starts to go a little bit uh, moving on the right and the left, having uh, some kind of a big, uh, uh, turbulence and uh, uh, side uh, uh, incident circulation, which can make uh, the navigation relatively more complicated. But uh, practically, uh, every information that we will find out, and uh, including the one we found out uh, up to now, will be available for the public. So any laboratory in the States or probably in the world will be interested in the, in the information and in the observation that we are doing here. But as a defense, you know, just to uh, note one thing, uh, if we are able to drift silently all along the American coast, uh, several other submarines, and maybe not American, will be able to do it too. Frank Busby, a Naval Oceanographic Office scientist. In this particular case, I'm monitoring the side scan sonar, which we use to acoustically map the bottom of the ocean. Uh, primarily, what we're interested in is determining to what extent the submersible can be used as a surveying platform. For centuries, we've surveyed from the surface, and we find that we've come up with a lot of gaps or holidays in our records, if you will. 
We've used a submersible to remap areas that we map from the surface, and we find almost an entirely different picture. Also from the Naval Oceanographic Office, an eminent British exchange scientist, Kenneth Haig. Uh, we're using acoustics to uh, study the, the water column, the uh, ocean floor, and the biology of the water column itself. We have a number of equipments installed for this purpose. For instance, this equipment over here uh, is measuring the seawater temperature, the salinity, and the speed of sound, and the pressure of the water. And it's measuring this every two seconds and recording the information onto magnetic tape. Down here, uh, I have a loudspeaker which is on continuously, and this is being fed by a hydrophone, which uh, is located on a boom aft of the vessel, and this hydrophone is constantly monitoring fish noises um, and other interesting phenomena of that sort. This equipment here, for instance, is being used to investigate the deep scattering layer. On this mission, we shall be able to observe them visually and at the same time uh, investigate them with acoustics, measuring their, their size by means of acoustics, for instance. And further forward here, we have two instruments which are concerned with the ocean floor. Uh, this one is measuring the gravity field. This one is measuring the Earth's magnetic field. And these two will give us ideas of the changes in the geological properties of the ocean floor. Overall, well, the, the prime uh, motive behind the uh, mission, of course, is to investigate the Gulf Stream. And never before has it been investigated to, to this great extent, as we're doing here. One month's continuous measurements of the Gulf Stream is something which has never even been approached. Uh, in the past. The National Aeronautics and Space Agency also has a scientist aboard, Chester May. We are self-contained uh, down here. We, we have no ties to the surface. So here we are away from the regular society, away from the actual uh, social environment in which each of us normally move. And uh, this is one of the things that we're interested in in the space program. How does uh, uh, man effectively perform uh, isolated from his normal social uh, environment. The operator and chief pilot is Don Casimir of Grumman Aerospace Corporation, a former Navy submarine officer. Assisting him is Erwin Ebersold of Switzerland, associate of Dr. Jacques Picard. On July 14, 1969, at 10.40 in the morning, the historic voyage begins. The hatch closes on the six men inside, not to lift again until 30 days have passed. The submersible is towed 19 miles offshore from Palm Beach, Florida. Then it is cast free to submerge into the Gulf Stream. Now the Ben Franklin is on its own, on its way, drifting with the stream. The unknown lies ahead. What audacity of man to enter this forbidden domain of a giant stream and become a part of its dynamic forces. Men do such things for the sake of scientific knowledge, for understanding of the unknown. Men have risked their lives for less. The days inside the Ben Franklin begin to pass. The work proceeds routinely. All is normal. So goes the word daily by sonar telephone to the support ship privateer. Also on the surface is the Naval Oceanographic Office ship, the USNS Lynch. This is a unique opportunity for the Navy to further its continuous search for greater understanding and control over the ocean environment in which it operates. The scientists on the ship gather their own data on the Gulf Stream. After the drift mission, it will be compared to and correlated with that from the Ben Franklin. A Navy oceanographic research plane, too, flies the path of the Gulf Stream, taking additional readings. 
It is July 22nd, and below the surface is the Ben Franklin's ninth day under sea. The submersible encounters a dangerous situation. Off the coast of South Carolina, it has to quickly rise to avoid collision with bottom obstacles 100 feet high. The daily reports continue. Strong vertical wave movements are making depth holding difficult. On the 10th day, 24 hours is devoted to a photo making cruise of the sea bottom. The first time this has ever been done. The crew describes the bottom life as fantastic. The marine life, they say, is more beautiful than anything seen thus far. On the 11th day, vertical waves throw the Ben Franklin off course. Temperatures inside drop to 57 degrees, making work difficult for the crew. The 12th day, internal waves cause the submersible to ascend rapidly. These waves are attributed to seafloor features which do not show up on charts. The sudden absence of marine life and the deep scattering layer is puzzling to the scientists. On the 13th day, the unexpected happens. With 450 miles of its undersea voyage completed, suddenly the Franklin is caught up in strong eddy currents which spin the submersible out of the Gulf Stream. The crew decides to conserve power and surface for a tow 50 miles eastward, keeping the hatches sealed to maintain their isolated environment. The tow completed, the Ben Franklin again dives into the Gulf Stream depths and continues its northward drift. The dangerous incident demonstrates that the jet core of the Gulf Stream is unpredictable and must be charted scientifically. August 5th, activity is stepped up. The submersible is now drifting at a depth of 750 feet, 265 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. 2.5 knots, marine life returning. Large numbers of whales, dolphins, and sharks sighted. Also swarms of plankton. August 6th, the Franklin passes the 1,000 mile mark. Tuna clearly seen in natural light at 600 feet. Reports indicate drift speed continues to increase to three knots and at times to four knots. Inside the Ben Franklin, all is going well. The scientists and crew are beginning to plan the mission's end. August 14th, this is it. 300 miles south-southeast of Halifax, Nova Scotia, the Ben Franklin surfaces at exactly 7.58 a.m. The men emerge to see the sky for the first time in 30 days. The Coast Guard cutter Cook Inlet will take them home. The Gulf Stream Drift Mission has been an outstanding success for the Grumman Aerospace Company, for the United States Navy, and for Dr. Jacques Picard and his men. The dream is now a reality. The Ben Franklin and its crew have answered many questions about the inner mysteries of the Gulf Stream, but there are even more that must be investigated. Other scientists will follow the path these men have traveled. The Ben Franklin is now gone from the Gulf Stream. It looks the same as it always did, but it can never again be the same. For man has entered its forbidden depths and emerged with new knowledge, knowledge that will lead to final mastery of the seas.